Beach. We're now diving into the outlook for tech in 2025. For that, I want to welcome in Ian Tien, CEO and co-founder of Matter Most. Ian, thank you so much for joining us today. All right, let's talk about what your outlook is for 2025, especially when we think about how AI is growing. Uh, are we still in the early innings or are we starting to get to where AI begins to mature? I think it's both. I think I think there's a tremendous amount of AI acceleration happening, but it's not consistent. There's some organizations that are way far ahead and some that are just picking it up as, as we go. So I think that next year you're going to see it. Uh, you're going to see it much moving, I believe, more, much more towards these AI first economies. And when you think about that, is the leadership still about, say, the NVIDIA of the world, uh, those who create the GPUs, et cetera, like NVIDIA, Broadcom, AMD, et cetera? I think those are really exciting companies, and I think mm. you'll see you know, the follow-ons. So you're going to have all this infrastructure, all this CapEx. Where's the energy going to come from? So there's going to be huge energy demands. On the application side, you have companies like ServiceNow and Zoom that are mm -hmm. taking AI and embedding it in everything they do. So I think that the workflow and the work that we do day-to-day -day will be AI first and you know the infrastructure is going to power that but i think that's what's coming this year let me ask you i want to ask you what's in, what's most important from your point of view servicing the demand because obviously there's a huge demand need for uh, for ai and for the the power behind it you know you have all of this, uh, the restarting of Three Mile Island, et cetera, and what's needed to fuel um, AI and the, the power behind it, or is the priority, does it need to be, or does it need to be kind of balanced, the protection of the data? Well, that's, a, that's a very complex question. So you definitely need both. So the big issues that are going to come with AI are going to be on security mm -hmm. and compliance and all the things that can go wrong. This is a new way to work. Mm -hmm. It's going to have new vulnerabilities and new cyber threats. On the other side, you've got the scale and capacity challenges where you're going to surge and if it's not available right now, you're going to depend on it so much that you have to make that capacity come online as, as fast as possible and meet the demand. So you have to be able to meet the demand and not fall over, but you also be secure and compliant. Meet the demand and not fall over. I like that. I want to go back to, you mentioned Salesforce, and one of the big things that they brought up at their Dreamforce convention that they have annually is Agent Force, right? And they talk about that being, you know, kind of the next generation uh, or the next iteration of uh, utilizing AI. When you think about it, not just being co-pilot, but it's now, it's an agent AI. Uh, is that really where kind of the software space is going when it comes to the use case for AI. I think it's I think it's definitely a step along the way. You want to have agents that help you do certain things, and you can sort of delegate tasks to them. What is the what the what the a lot of the tech folks what they're seeing is beyond agents is really thinking about digital twins. So you and I are talking right now, and hey, everything that you're saying is recorded. So what if you're not available at like 3 a.m. Right? So <laughs> what do you mean? What if I'm not? I'll be here. <laughs> so so for a lot of people at work, they're like, well, my CFO is not available right now. My, right. my CEO is not available. If they were here, what would they say? How would they comment? So let's say I'm going public. I'm like, okay, I'm going to write the S1. Let me put the CTO and the CFO and the CEO in. And their agents, their, their sort of digital twins, will work on that document for them. And then if you say, like, oh, you know what? We forgot. Let's put the CISO in, and that's a different S1. So they're going to do the work knowing everything about how you work, having all your knowledge, and then they're going to do work for you. So I think beyond agents is this concept of digital twins. But, okay, so... I see pluses and minuses to that. Yes, okay, let's say hypothetically speaking, I'm not, or the CFO is not available at 3 a.m. Uh, that's great that you have a digital twin for that. You know, humans need sleep, and a digital twin wouldn't need that. But then you have the ethics question that comes up. What, how, what are the protections against anything that could kind of come up and create ethical challenges as a result? Or are there ethical challenges because it's a digital twin and not you present? I think there's, there's a lot of this. This is a, in an AI first economy, there's going to be new questions. For example, what if your CFO leaves? Right? Are you able to keep all the IP? Are you able to keep the digital twin of your CFO to help you when the new CFO comes in? Who owns that IP? And those questions aren't perfectly clear right now. It's like, well, where did the IP come from? Did it come from their emails and their video calls and all the recordings? Well, that stays with the company, but who owns that, that sort of digital twin of, of the people at work? Okay. What is your view on, say, the, uh, you know, obviously when we, we first started having this conversation about this, AI's been around for a while, but the generative AI piece, we started having this conversation in 2022 with the, you know, launch of OpenAI and ChatGPT. Then you had the Anthropic. Claude, et cetera. 
who is the leader there? Who do you see as the, the winners? Is it a winner take all? Is it a multiple winners? Uh, what's your view on that? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think, you know, in the lead it used to be the, the best AI engineers would create the best models. And that used to be sort of like the domain. But what's happened is, as you've seen, like these engineers move around to different companies, right? right? And they've found their own companies. So there's all these models that are, that are happening and it's, and it's really turning out to be not exactly a commodity, but they get very similar and differentiation kind of goes down. So then the differentiation is starting to come from the data. So what is the proprietary data that's behind these models mm -hmm. that can have it do things that other models can't? So think about LinkedIn, think about yeah. YouTube, think about Reddit, and what are the, what's special about the data in these models that can have it do things that others can't? I want to go back to something that we touched on a little bit when we, we talked about balancing the need, the demand need for AI and like the growth there versus uh, security. And you talked about cybersecurity. How important is it to address that, especially when you think about the increasing number of data breaches that we see? It's almost like I say we, myself included as humans, almost expect there to be breaches nowadays because so much of our information is just online. Where where is the onus on on protection of the data and cybersecurity? Yeah, that's a great question. There's the the key thing about an AI first economy and world is that you're going to have a rise in cyber threats. So think of a chess game where you have attackers and you have defenders, and the attackers just got the supercomputer, and now they can think 18 steps ahead. Mm -hmm. They can think about these moves that are not intuitive, and the attackers are going to be more are going to have more sophistication. So what when can the defenders sort of catch up? Mm -hmm. So so that's the question of the pendulum swinging when you have these new technologies. Who are the pawns in this then, since we're using the chess analogy? Is it us, the humans? Oh my gosh, it's so us. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let me give you an example, mm. right? So I'm a CEO and we've mm. got CFOs. Like you can take my, my LinkedIn profile, like my, my videos, my right. podcasts, and you can reproduce me. You can make something I don't that- like that. Oh man. <laughs> and and, and it's, it's out there in social media. You have people that like, you can reproduce yeah. me, my voice, my mannerisms, most of my history, and you know, that's an attack. So how do we, how do we you know, as this impersonation increases, you know, how do we defend against that? That, I mean, I, I, you can see me taking a moment to process this because I think about the negative uh, consequences of that. Obviously, like when you talk about the digital twin, that sounds great, but the negative is like when we see someone duplicate us across social media and then you're trying to reach out to the you know social media platform, someone has duped me, can you take this down, et cetera, and it doesn't always happen, you know. Um, so how can, say, governments balance the need for, because there's not a lot of regulation around AI, yet. Do you expect that, I don't, I mean, do you expect that to happen this year or is that something that seems to be further down the line and is the responsibility on the governments or on the corporations to police themselves? Yeah, I think that's, I think it's complex because you have the value exchange between the end user or the staffer mm -hmm. or the customer on, you know, what do they get in exchange for these AI services? And in some cases, you're like, well, you get the free version, but in the free right. version, you're going to be training, you know, our product. And, you know, what is the proper value exchange and where does that go to sort of out of bounds into the extreme case? And then I think there's a number of levers before you get to regulation. Mm -hmm. There's transparency, there's mm -hmm. pl platforms like Reddit and X that will call people out if it's like, well, this is a really, did you read the fine print? Right. And then you've got sort of like the threat of regulation, which is you know, a conversation that can come from governments to these big techs. And, and then if that doesn't work, then you actually have the regulation. So I think there's a lot of different um, levers to, to, keep the, to keep the systems on the rails, but there's a lot of risk. Okay, and I know this is this. We were talking. We led into this talking tech, but I do want to keep our focus on AI, especially because that is where tech really is nowadays. Um, is the question has been asked over the past few years now? Is AI a jobs creator or a jobs destroyer, or a little bit of both? Yeah. What's your view? I think, you know, it's like the internet in the early days. So it's like 1991, and it's like 14 4K modem, and it's like yeah. noisy, and you don't know. And then, you know, 1995, you actually, people are st it's starting to become mainstream, mm -hmm. and then suddenly it's everywhere. So there's going to be, you know, jobs that don't exist anymore, like an encyclopedia salesman, but that there's this whole new range of jobs, like social media d exists because of the internet. Mm -hmm. So the AI, just like any other technology, it's going to change the landscape, and there's going to be new jobs, uh, and, and some jobs going away. Okay, well, hopefully not our jobs. <laughs> All right. Ian Tien, uh, CEO of Mattermost, thank you so much for joining us today.